All right. Acts 17, 10, and 11. It says, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than they in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily uh, to see whether those things were so. All right, so that verse right there, uh, Luke is recounting a story of Paul and Silas running away from one church to the next. And what Luke is saying is that the people of the church of Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they doubted Paul and Silas' teachings. They doubted that they were correct, and they decided to look for themselves in the scriptures to ensure that what Paul and Silas taught them was actually the truth. And so initially, when I began to prepare this sermon, I thought, well, I preach a sermon on the importance of the ability to doubt yourself. And to, in, in kind of a constructive manner, right? So I wonder, I wonder if I interpreted that correctly, because we have the Bible and the Bible's perfect, but there's always a chance that we're going to misinterpret something in the Bible and we'll see something wrong, or overlook something, or just kind of read it with our lens that allows us to kind of get away with what we want. And so I was going to preach a lesson on the importance of the ability to doubt in kind of our spiritual lives. And uh, an important part of a lesson, I think, is... Uh, a kind of a direct tie to scripture, so like a story. So I always like to have a story from scripture when I'm going to be giving a talk. And so I started thinking about different stories that might contain someone in scripture doubting and becoming better because of that. And I started to think through scriptures and I didn't really see anything that um, too much pertained to that exact topic. So what I did see though, is stories similar to that and where someone might start out doubting and then someone comes along and helps them. So it never happens simultaneously or spontaneously by themselves. So there's never a, a never a story in the Bible where someone thinks, "Huh, maybe I'm wrong," and they just become better. Uh, it's always it's always stories like uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is on his way back from worshiping in Jerusalem. And he's reading Isaiah, and uh, he says uh, he says, "I don't really quite understand this." And so God sends Philip, and Philip comes along and he says. Hey, what are you reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, I'm reading Isaiah and here's why I'm confused. And from there, Philip's able to teach him the gospel and share with him, you know, salvation. And the Ethiopian eunuch had that start. He doubted, but he wasn't able to get there by himself. He had to have uh, uh, Philip's help. And then we see other stories like David and Bathsheba. I mean, David is considered a man after God's own heart. He was a, a very, like he's, he's, he's a very prominent character in the Bible. Um, and we see him make a huge mistake like he did with Bathsheba. So he had sent his men out to war, right? And uh, he stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, and that was probably considered wrong by most of the people of the era. He should have really been out with his troops. And while he's in Jerusalem, he's there hanging out on his roof and he looks over to a neighboring house and he sees a woman bathing. Well, that's not a sin. But then he looks again and he continues looking. He's like, wow, I want that woman. And so he goes and he gets that woman, he brings her in and he sleeps with her. And then later Bathsheba comes and she says, Hey, David, uh, I'm pregnant, so this is an issue. And at this point, you might think, well, David's heart maybe is pricked. Maybe he's going to search within himself and think, wow, I've done something wrong. I should probably repent. But no, he's like, I know how to fix this issue. I'm going to call Joab, my commander, and tell him to send home Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, and I'm going to get him drunk. So he does that, brings him home, has him drink some wine, and then he says, okay, why don't you go and sleep with your wife now? And Uriah, he's a noble soldier. He says, no. I wouldn't go and take the pleasures of my house and sleep in my bed when my men are out on the field sleeping on the hard ground. So he instead sleeps on David's palace's steps. And then David gives him a note to send back to Joab. And the note essentially says, wherever the fighting is thickest, send Uriah in there. And then once the fighting is hot, pull back and let Uriah die. Joab does this and Uriah dies. And David at this point is like, well, perfect, problem solved. Takes Bathsheba, makes, him his, makes her his wife. And then uh, he's like, well, good, we're good. And you think at any, any point along there, there's a couple of points where he might have realized he was, you know, in the wrong. It wasn't, it was possibly he might have realized whenever Uriah came and per, kind of put him to shame by saying, I'm not going to take relaxation while my men are out on the field. You might have thought uh, it was when Bathsheba was pregnant, but it wasn't. He never, he never came to that conclusion by himself. Instead, Nathan the prophet had to come and say, David, let me tell you a story. He says, so there was a man who had a sheep and it was, it was like a, part of his family, right? The sheep was part of his family. It, it slept with him and his children in their house. It ate their food and it drank out of their bowl. And he had a rich neighbor. And the neighbor had many sheep and large fields. And the rich neighbor had fam family over, some friends from out of town. And instead of killing one of his own sheep, 
the neighbor took that man's sheep and killed it and gave it to his uh, guests. And David was like convicted right away. And he said, this man should be killed. And Nathan goes, David, that man is you. And at that point, David is pricked and David realizes that he is messed up. So again, I mean, David has so many opportunities here to realize he's done wrong, but he doesn't because he's justifying his own actions because this is something that we do pretty consistently and we do it really well. Um, another, another prominent example would be Saul. Uh, well, Saul was a very learned man, right? He was trained under some of the most educated people in Jerusalem in that time. And uh, he knew the Torah and the law very well. And he was lived the events of Jesus' coming, and he still didn't recognize that that was the Messiah. And in, in fact, he didn't recognize that until God literally appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the bricks. And at that point, Saul realized, oh, man, I've messed up. And then God sent him into Damascus, and some of the brothers in Christ were able to help him, lead him on the way, and show him how uh, he was wrong. So the point there is that, you know, it is important to doubt, to be able to question the fact that you might be wrong. Uh, but it's not something I think that we're really capable of doing on our own, right? So we're going to have wrong ideas and wrong beliefs, but we need our brothers in Christ to help us to steer us back on the path. And so the root for this lesson is actually going to be Proverbs 27 and verse 17, where it says, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So there's some important things about that verse. Like we were talking about earlier, it doesn't just say iron is sharpened and becomes better. No, it's iron sharpens iron. You have to have two pieces of iron, in this case, two Christians, and they sharpen each other and they become better. Um, so the fact that you can't have one piece of iron just becoming sharper by itself reminds me a little bit of the first law or the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially states that a system left on its own will tend towards disorder. So you have a system say an ice cube. Uh, if you leave it on its own in a room, it's going to melt, turn into water. That's more disordered than ice. And humans tend to follow the law of nature. So if just me out in the world, I'm just kind of doing my thing out in the world, I am not going to just become more godly by myself. I'll pick up bad habits from people out in the world, and I'll become slowly worse and worse. Uh, unless there is useful work put into that system, uh, it's never going to tend towards order by itself. And I think that we really follow that principle as humans. We need that useful work put in. Um, and another interesting aspect of this second law of thermodynamics is that a system doesn't become more ordered unless it's energy, the energy input is coming from a system that is more ordered than the system you're trying to order. So for instance, an ice cube will never transfer order to water. What that means is that you don't put the ice cube in water and the water freezes. What happens instead is the ice cube melts. The order always goes from the most ordered system and it dilutes out into the less ordered system and it all becomes kind of an equilibrium, right? It's kind of like the verse in Proverbs that says bad company corrupts good morals. It doesn't say that there's a chance where the good morals will corrupt the bad company and it all becomes better, right? It's just, it's just kind of the law of nature. Things tend towards disorder unless you put work in. And so I think this concept is really carried well in the Bible. I mean, take, for instance, uh, Matthew 7, 5, where Jesus says, before trying to remove a speck from your brother's eye, make sure to remove the beam from your own eye. That's essentially, in this context, we can say, before trying to help someone order their own life, make sure your life is ordered, right? Make sure you have yourself in order. Um, and so that's kind, of, that's kind of the background for sharpening, right? You need to be able to be ordered in order to be kind of efficient, an efficient tool for Christ out in the field, right? A knife that's super dull isn't very useful, but if you sharpen it, it can be used from quite a lot of different ways. Um, so I'd like to kind of take an example of sharpening directly from the scripture. And I think a really good one is when Paul, I guess, sharpens Peter in Galatians 2 verses 11 through 21. Uh, so I'd like to read that really quick. So Galatians 2, 11 through 21. Okay, so, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. 
And other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimultation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the works of Christ. And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sins? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nonetheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So that's a really, I mean, that's a really profound and deep passage, and there's a lot in there. But I don't really want to get into the content of what Paul said. I kind of want to look at the scenario that he said it in. So Paul had come to this church at Antioch, and he'd seen some issues happening, right? He had seen people treating the Gentiles differently because they weren't circumcised. They were embarrassed, essentially, to eat with the Gentiles. So they'd be eating, and they would leave and go eat with someone else, eat with other Jews, so they weren't seen eating with the Gentiles. And I mean, that makes sense. Formerly, that would have been considered bad to eat with the uncircumcised. They were unclean, right? So that was, that was kind of ingrained in their minds, but it was wrong. And it was pretty significantly wrong. I mean, if you think about it, this is a problem that could easily have led to people being led astray or people who might have been saved might not have been saved because of this practice. This isn't something that Christians want to demonstrate, right? This isn't love. And so Paul sees this and he probably came up to James and said, hey, James, so what's happening here? Why is this behavior occurring? And James said, well, this is what Peter taught me. And so this is how I practice my doctrine. And Paul probably uh, sat down with James and talked with him and they sorted things out and they figured out this is wrong. And he probably corrected everyone else at that church that was uh, participating in this behavior. And then he probably heard that Peter was coming to Antioch and he said, I need to correct Peter and it needs to be in front of the church that this doctrine, uh, this bad doctrine can be killed once and for all in front of everybody. Because for, especially with issues important as this, it's important that they are brought up in front of the whole church. And that's, you know, talked about in other places in the Bible, but we'll not get into that now. So Paul has this really elegant speech that he gives to Peter that we just read. And I would think that Paul didn't just come up with this on the spot. I doubt that Peter walked in and he's like, oh, Peter, and then says that passage right there. That's that's incredibly elegant. And it's possible. Um, I mean, Paul was inspired. But I mean, Peter later in, where was it? First Peter 3.15 says, we should always be ready to give a defense for the hope that was that is within us. Um, and maybe, maybe that was partially inspired by Paul's speech that he gave to him, that he defended, right? So it's it's important that if we are attempting to sharpen someone, that we make sure we're first in the right, like Matthew says. We have to make sure that there's no beam in our eye and that our doctrine is sound. And then we need to go through and we need to make sure that whatever thought we have that we need to share with this person can be expressed in a way where it's not going to just lead to frustration of both, both parties, right? Imagine if the situation was different and Peter had walked in and Paul said, Peter, the doctrine you're teaching is wrong. Here's the right doctrine, right? That's not going to convince anybody. Uh, Paul... Peter would probably have gotten angry because Paul is a younger Christian than him. Paul didn't walk with Jesus. Paul formerly persecuted the Jews. So maybe Peter would have started spouting some of that stuff off. And then Paul would have gotten frustrated. And then the whole church would have been confused. Like, who do we follow? I mean, there's Paul and there's Peter. So this is super important that we keep in mind that when we do need to sharpen someone, and it does need to happen sometimes. I mean, we're all going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. And that needs to be corrected. But when that happens, we need to do it in the right manner. We need to be prepared and be ready to give a defense, you know, for that hope that is within us. And, and so, I mean, we see we see Paul just do that so elegantly, and he gives that gives that speech. And then, um, I mean, I assume that Peter took it well, and uh, the problem was corrected because we don't hear about it again. Um, but honestly, out of the iron sharpening iron, I would assume that the part where you're being sharpened is the more difficult of the two. Uh, Because it's not easy to be sharpened, right? I mean, think about the word sharpen. 
when you're sharpening a tool, you're removing material from the tool. It has to be ground off and removed. And I mean, assume that's not pleasant for the tool, I would assume. Uh, and so let's talk for a little bit about the process of being sharpened and how we can take that properly. So first, in order to be sharpened, an idea or a belief that we have essentially needs to die, right? Even if it's just changing a little bit, it's being replaced by this new idea or this new belief. And it's not easy to kill ideas and beliefs. In fact, they're very incredibly powerful things. I once heard a, a psychologist say that an idea is something that almost possesses a person and it can grow so strong to the point where it will kill them. And I thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Ideas can't kill people. But most of what this guy says is, you know, pretty accurate. And I think he's a pretty wise individual. And so I thought about it. I thought, what kind of an idea could grow so strong as to kill a person? Well, maybe the idea that my country is the best country on this planet, patriotism. Maybe the idea that my family is the most important thing in the world and I give my life for them. Maybe the idea that I have a God that is powerful and awesome and amazing and uh, all perfect and good, you know, religion. I mean, we see examples of soldiers giving their life for their country. Uh, we see examples of family members giving their life for other family members. And we've seen plenty of examples throughout history and the Bible of people being willing to die for Christ. So ideas are that powerful. Ideas can be powerful enough to kill, right? And that's something we need to consider both when we're being sharpened and when we're sharpening because you're killing a little part of who that person was. You're changing them, right? And so it's kind of important to keep that, the gravity of the situation in mind because it's not a light matter for an idea to die. And it's, it's not always necessarily that the idea is that you know, powerful of an idea. Most of them aren't. But that doesn't mean any idea is hard to kill. Uh, for, for an idea to change in your mind, you essentially have to admit you're wrong. You know, whether we know it or not, we all have a complete view of the world. Even if that view says in some parts, I don't know and it doesn't matter. Even changing that belief from I don't know and it doesn't matter to yes, it does matter and here's why can be a really difficult thing to admit because you have to admit you were wrong to change any of your ideas. And that's not something we like to do. Um, and it, this, this kind of reminds me of Hebrews 12, uh, where he says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, right? I mean, to be sharpened, we have to lay aside some of these weights and some of these sins in order to become more useful, right? It's similar, and it's a similar analogy. For a knife to be useful, it has to be sharp. For you to be able to run fast, you have to not be carrying any weights. And, you know, sometimes you might have to lay aside things that aren't even necessarily sins, right? And that'd probably be more difficult than laying aside a sin because a sin is pretty obvious. You can find a place in the Bible that says this is wrong and you can realize that that's wrong and lay it aside. But sometimes there are thing we have, things we have to lay aside that aren't even sins, you know, the weights that Paul or whoever the writer of Hebrews is talking about. And those might be more difficult to lay aside because we don't necessarily know that they're wrong, but maybe someone comes to you and says, hey, this lifestyle you've been engaging in, this habit that you have, it's counterproductive. It's not helping you in your race, in your you know, attempts to be a useful Christian. This is something that's hindering you. And you might say, well, it's not a sin. And you're like, yeah, but it's not helping. And so you should lay it aside. You should lay it aside. And that's something we have to be willing to do. And it's, it's part of the process of being sharpened is being willing to lay aside these ideas. And another part of the process of being sharpened is the ability to listen. I see this happen frequently where someone will, will start to say, hey, so that interaction you just had, I saw that. I could tell the other person was a little bit hurt. And I think something you said was wrong. And then the person that they're trying to correct goes, oh, no, 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 here's why I'm right. That person wasn't hurt. This is how the situation actually went and just kind of shuts the person down right away. When I say that, I mean me, I do that all the time. That's something I really like to do is interrupt people, finish their sentence for them and tell them exactly what it's actually supposed to be. And uh, I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing to do. Whenever I do that, the person that I do that to Oftentimes my mom, I, 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 see, I see just like a little, a little light in her eyes die because she was trying to help me. And I think, you know, I don't need help. Got this figured out, but that's just my pride talking, right? I do need help. I can't do this on my own. And I, I need that, that little, you know, correction every once in a while when many things that I do. But it's important that we listen to the whole matter, even if the person that is correcting us might be wrong. You know, there's always that chance that the person trying to sharpen you is actually in need of sharpening themselves. And that's why, as we talked about earlier, you should prepare yourself before going to correct somebody. 
because maybe maybe that person has been saying something super rude to you and you're just really irritated. Maybe you go ask someone else and say, hey, is this person consistently with being rude or is that just me? And they're like, no, you've been in a terrible attitude lately. Uh, everything anyone says has been making you angry. And, uh, you know, that's not really on them. That's on you. You need to you know, fix that yourself. So it's this it's this idea of working together to ensure that, you know, we can correct each other and we can, you know, talk about but possibilities where we've gone wrong. Um, and so Proverbs uh, 1728 says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace, right? So even if you're a fool, you're counted wise if you hold your peace. So in that situation where someone's correcting you, even if they're wrong, you can probably gain something from what they're saying. Um, and so you can only gain that though, if you hold your peace. Uh, there's this book I've been reading lately. It's called The 12 Rules for Life. And there are these kind of, ways to live your life that might be considered radical if you weren't a Christian. Uh, the author isn't a Christian, but he quotes the Bible frequently in the book. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a great book. Um, and one of the rules is uh, always assume that the person standing opposite you knows something that you don't, right? If you go into a conversation with the assumption that the person you're talking to knows something you don't, and you have a desire to learn from that conversation, you're going to sit there and you're going to listen to what they have to say. Even if, you know, possibly they're a less experienced person than you are, possibly they're a less intelligent person they are, than you are, possibly, you know, they haven't been a Christian for as long as you were, they're not as old as you were, you know, however it goes. But if you go into every conversation thinking, I think this person standing opposite me knows something I don't and I want to learn it, you'll f we'll, we'll have so much more beneficial conversations and we'll have that ability to be sharpened. Because it's incredibly important as we're out in the world, we will kind of lose our edge, we'll lose we'll lose touch with God's word. We'll start doing something and then find ways to justify it in God's word. And we're not even realize, we're realizing we're doing it. We're just really good at compensating and making sure that we're comfortable with everything that we're doing. So it's really important that we have that ability as Christians to both sharpen and to be sharpened because we have to do that constantly for each other in order to remain sharp and to be able to remain a useful tool in God's service. Um, and if we don't have this ability, we'll all kind of be that system that sits there with no useful work input and we'll just slowly kind of fade out and lose the edge and lose touch with God's word. So we have to be there for each other and sharpen each other in order to remain useful. Anyway, that's, that's what I have for you tonight. I hope that kind of those ramblings made sense and you were able to gain something from that. And if not, I hope it confused you enough where you go and look through your scriptures and find something and say, hey, Stephen, uh, you're wrong and here's why. Um, but anyway, if you were in any way pricked and you have, uh, I feel like you have a need to come forward and say something, uh, the elders or myself or Tommy or anyone else here would be happy to help sharpen or be sharpened by or with you. And so uh, if you have anything, any, anything you'd like to talk about, would you please come forward as we stand and as we sing?